religious government that we saw in the demonstrations uh, in the last three weeks. And although the, the Muslim Brotherhood might put together a, a party, uh, public opinion polls that I have seen show that only about 15% of Egyptians would support uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And so there'll be one of many uh, parties to run, and I don't think there's any uh, likelihood at all of them prevailing and establishing uh, Sharia or Islamic law that would prevent the demonstrators' desire for peace and freedom to be realized. There's clearly been a domino effect uh, in the Middle East, yes. pr principally through social media. Uh, I'm wondering, what should the U.S.'s role be now? We, how do we balance our security and financial interests with our role in fostering democracy in that part of the world? Well, we've come a long way in recent years. And, and although we have been uh, very close to Mubarak and we've been close to other uh, dictators in the Middle East that don't permit any kind of freedoms as we cherish them, uh, we used to have the same arrangement in South America. For instance, when I became president, the previous presidents, including President Johnson and others, had uh, been very close to the dictators in South America. Most of the countries in South America were military dictatorships. And our business community in America formed uh, partnerships to make sure they got first choice at uh, iron and steel and bauxite and, and pineapples and bananas or anything that might be attractive coming out of South America. And, and what our business community wanted and what our political leaders wanted too, and that included political leaders on both sides uh, in the Congress and in the White House, was to have stability. And stability is quite often in competent and incomparable with, uh, with freedoms. So whenever any uh, demonstrators like the ones we saw in Tunisia and Egypt rose up or began to rise up in South America, we would say they are communists, they're all communists, and we've got to stamp them out because that might be a threat to us. And we would even send in Marines and the army to back up the dictators in holding down any sort of freedom fighters. And a lot of them were indigenous Indians, and just poor people looking for better lives. That changed, and, and I was part of that change when I became president. And by within five years after I left the White, Off, White House, every country in South America had become a democracy, and they still are, by the way. Although some are not quite friendly with us, like, like, uh, like for instance, my, say Venezuela. But anyway, they're democracies. So I think that uh, this will be a, uh, a signal to the United States that like we did in South America, to start doing the same thing uh, in the Middle East area, particularly in the Arab countries, and permit uh, freedom of, uh, increasing freedom of elections. Some countries like Jordan, which we visit regularly, uh, have uh, something of an election for parliamentary members. And the three elections that we have monitored in Palestine, in the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, have been completely open, free, democratic, and safe. So it's, a, it's a, almost a pure democracy, although they are not in existence right this moment. And we had a very good election in Lebanon uh, this past April. I was there, and, we, and the Carter Center monitored that election as well. So I think that there's some kind of breaking the groundwork, even in some of the Arab countries with uh, control from the center, uh, for opening up. And I think the United States will be much more cautious in the future of taking sides overtly or openly with the military dictatorships, including Arab friends who are who, uh, Arab leaders who are our friends, uh, if there is an honest exhibition of desire for more democracy. Even in Saudi Arabia, there have been 10 leaders, most of them uh, professors, by the way, who have, who have formed a political party. Uh, that's as far as they've gotten. They've asked the king to approve their party. And I'm, I'm sure that if, if uh, King Abdullah says no, then they will disband immediately. But uh, there are uh, glimpses of what freedom means now. And I would, I would guess that in Yemen might be the next uh, crucial area. Bahrain lately has had pretty large demonstrations. Syria is fairly stable. They have a young, fairly progressive uh, president uh, who inherited the office from his father. But, but I think that uh, the United States in the future will be much more amenable to uh, democracy taking over even in the Arab countries where their leaders are our close friends. What about Iran, Mr. President? We've seen there that there's been a 
uh, severe uh, reaction against the opposition yes. among the leadership, uh, significantly different than Egypt. What do you think will transpire there in the coming days? Well, you remember about eight or nine years ago, there was an honest and fair election in, in Iran, and a, and a very moderate uh, president uh, was elected. And he served until uh, Netanyahu uh, became president. Uh, probably uh, Netanyahu was elected fairly the first time when he took office. But then in this last election, there's great doubts about whether it was an honest election. The ultimate power in Iran is obviously uh, religious. The uh, Ayatollah uh, Khomeini in uh, Iran makes the ultimate decisions, even vetoing what Netanyahu, the elected president, says he would like to do on many occasions. So I, I don't really see any prospect at this time, as much as we would like to see it, of uh, a president being elected that's not approved directly by the religious leaders. As a matter of fact, even in previous elections that I just described in, in fairly a complimentary way, the Ayatollah and his, and his religious leaders, they can decide if a candidate can run or not run for the parliament and for president. So they have veto power over any candidate. So they make a very good, careful screening process to make sure no radicals would be elected who might be a, a danger to the present uh, Sharia law and the leadership of the, of, the, um, of, it, uh, of the Ayatollahs. How has President Obama done in handling the, the Middle Eastern situation? I think he's done quite well uh, the last three weeks in handling the Egyptian situation. At first, uh, he and the Secretary of uh, State and the Vice President were saying that Mubarak was our friend, that we needed to have stability, uh, and that uh, someday there might be a change there, and we trusted Mubarak to make the changes. That was the first series of statements made by the President and all of his subordinates. But as the times changed from one week to another, they became more and more supportive of the... Uh, of the dissidents in, uh, in, 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 who were demonstrating against Mubarak. And then finally, the president announced that he wanted to see the changes made to a democracy and freedom now. And that's when Mubarak responded very angrily that he wouldn't respond to outside pressure. So I would, I would say that in general, that Obama has handled Egypt uh, very well about the same way I would have handled it if I'd been in office. Because <laughs> I, would, I would probably have been loyal to Mubarak at the beginning because the United States doesn't want to sig send signals to all of our other friends in the Middle East that we will abandon you the first time demonstrators go public. And so we had to show our friends and allies in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia and other places that we will back you as long as you meet minimal standards on freedom and democracy. But once it became clear that Mubarak would not do so, then we did the right thing in, in giving our support completely to the, to the revolutionaries. And I would say that they didn't want it, they did not want American support or need it because they didn't want to brand it, be branded accurately by the allegation that they were being controlled from Washington. They wanted the world to know that there was a self-originating uh, effort for freedom and that they didn't depend on Washington to uh, let them be successful. More broadly, Mr. President, how do you think Obama has done since stepping into office in uh, January 2009? Well, I think he's done the best he could in, in domestic affairs, dealing with problems that uh, President Johnson and I and none of the predecessors of Obama ever had to face. That, that is a completely polarized nation and a completely polarized Congress. You have to remember that the major things that Obama uh, advocated when he came in office after he promised his, them in his campaign, uh, sometimes on those major issues that the Republicans had supported earlier, he couldn't get a single vote among Republicans in the House or Senate. So they made a determination at the beginning, the Republicans did, that they wouldn't support Obama on anything. I think after the election in November, during the so-called lame duck conference uh, session, they, they moder moderated their position a little bit. But he was faced with opposition 
in the Congress that I never experienced. In fact, my main challenge in the Congress when I was president was the liberal Democrats. <laughs> because uh, after the first year I was in office, um, Ted Kennedy decided to run for president against me, and he garnered a lot of support from the more liberal Democrats, so I had to turn to the conservative Democrats and the moderate Republicans to help me, and that's why we were very successful. And in fact, nobody since in this uh, last 50 years has been more successful at the Congress than I was, except one, and that was Lyndon Johnson, as you all know. So I, I would say that on domestic affairs, he's done the best he could, and he's prevailed on a number of issues for which he hadn't got much credit. As far as the Middle East was concerned, uh, I was very pleased when President Obama made his speech in Cairo calling for an end to the settlements because I and almost all Obama's predecessors until recently have said that every settlement built in Palestine was both illegal and an obstacle to peace. And uh, when he made his speech in Cairo, he said that all the settlements had to cease. But under great pressure, which I have experienced myself both before I was president, before I graduated from the presidency and after I left, uh, I know what that pressure can be. And so he's completely backed down. And he's uh, now re more recently been uh, more accommodating to the demands of Netanyahu and the Israelis even than George W. Bush was. As a matter of fact, uh, a few months ago, uh, the Obama administration uh, spokesperson was Hillary Clinton made an offer to the uh, Israelis of things that no previous president had ever offered them just if they would stop building settlements for three months. And uh, Netanyahu turned him down. And so as a result of that, I think President Obama has, has basically given up on peace in the Middle East. So we don't have anything going on now as far as... Uh, as uh, bringing peace between Israel and the Palestinians is concerned, or between Israel and the uh, Syrians on the Golan Heights, or between Israel and Lebanon. Nothing's going on. And in the past number of months, when Omar Suleiman, who was Mubarak's vice president, was negotiating between one group of Palestinians, Fatah and Hamas, to bring them together with a reconciliation so they could have another election, the United States basically vetoed that whole process because Israel re preferred that they not be reunited. So, so I, I don't have any uh, feeling of, of uh, success in what President Obama has done in the Middle East. Uh, I'm not here to criticize him, but you asked me, and, I'm, and I've told you the truth. My hope is as I said just in passing earlier, that the shakeup in Egypt and the potential shakeup in other countries will, will cause some new flexibility, at least in addressing the issues uh, on which the entire international community agrees that Israel should withdraw from the West Bank and East Jerusalem, except to modify the borders where the main settlements are and that the Palestinians should be given the right to have their own elections and choose their own people, and that uh, Palestine, uh, if it's the name of the nation, and the Palestinians and Israel should live in peace and harmony with a two-state solution. The impending threat now is a one-state solution, which means just one Israel, all the way between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And at this moment, uh, Jews are in a minority. There's a majority of non-Jews living in that one state right now. Israelis still have the more number of votes because many of the Arabs, who are a lot of Christians and Muslims, are not yet old enough to vote. But it's obvious that in the future, there'll be a majority living in that one state who are not Jews. So Israel will have to make a choice then of... Uh, of persecuting the Palestinians so they can't vote, or permitting a vote where, where the Jews might be in a minority, where they would no longer have control of the whole government. And, and that's something that nobody wants. So what we want is a two-state solution with Israel living in its present country, 
with modification of the borders and, and the Palestinians living in their country, 